If you're like me, you've had experiences with Gen AI where it turned up bad information and you thought, wow, it's a good thing I checked that. That's easy when the errors are clear. But as the tools get better and they're built into our workflows, we inevitably let our guard down. In our quest to work faster and relieve our teams of boring tasks, even the proverbial human in the loop isn't enough to ensure accuracy. That's because humans are also vulnerable to errors and biases and we may either trust AI too much or not enough. A recent field experiment by MIT and Accenture explored ways to flag Gen AI mistakes to the humans involved in the work without actually slowing them down. To find out more about this study, I interviewed Dr. Renee Richardson Gosling, a research scientist and senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Renee heads the Human First AI Group at MIT's Initiative on the Digital Economy. She's an expert on how AI affects human judgment and the interplay of human and AI bias. In this interview, Dr. Gosling explains the behaviors that are at work when we trust AI too much or too little and why we need to add a bit of friction in order to use AI in a responsible way. So I would love to just hear a little bit about your research and your, your academic focus. Sure. So I've been researching human and AI interaction since 2017. What I focus on is how humans interact with AI, particularly as it relates to decision making and judgment. So I want to understand the circumstances under which an algorithm improves human judgment and the circumstances under which actually it makes it potentially worse, perhaps proliferating bias, or leading people to suboptimal choice. And so I take a structural view to understand what can we do to the systems in which people make decisions to improve uh, the trust in algorithms and to improve their trustworthiness. And so you've just completed a really fascinating bit of research <clears throat> around generative AI. And there's sort of common wisdom now that it's important to have human in the loop when you're working with generative AI. But your research turned up something more. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, I think you're right that we've come to embrace human in the loop, but what does that mean? And what are the benefits and what are the limitations to this? So we conducted an experiment uh, in collaboration with Accenture. So how can we, within AI-mediated systems, intentionally and consciously add friction that's beneficial to the process, to the human, and improves decision making. That sounds so counter to what people are trying to do with Gen AI. I mean, yes. it's all about doing things faster and making things more efficient, more productive. That's so, right. so how do you weigh that sort of trade-off between efficiency and accuracy? It's a good question because I feel like in managerial circles, the word friction has become synonymous with pain point. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, it does feel a little bit counterintuitive. But turns out that we can think about friction the way that friction is discussed in physics. So if you look at physics, friction is a force and it's neither good nor bad, it's a force. And you can use it uh, to your benefit you can work against it at times. But if you're trying to run, for instance, friction is not your enemy. The runner needs friction in order to accelerate. Without friction, the runner is sliding all over the place. Without friction, the runner can't change direction. And I think that's really important, particularly when we talk to organizations with AI, because changing direction may be something that we need to be able to do. And so in this study, we looked at how can we intentionally have cognitive speed bumps and procedural speed bumps to say, hang on, what's happening? And do we want to proceed? Should we correct? That would hopefully increase the benefit of having humans in the loop. So let's back up just a little bit to what, what is the problem that your research intends to solve? So the problem that we're trying to solve is that in a move fast and break things world, <laughs> there are uh, billions of dollars being poured into AI. And the pace of that adoption is faster than our understanding of what it means and how to use it and how to, to minimize harm. 
And so the question we're trying to sort of answer is, is there a way that we could use beneficial friction to improve accuracy when using generative AI without sacrificing the efficiency in terms of time that generative AI promises to have? Mm -hmm. So if you think of organizations that have people writing reports, doing research for clients in industries, you could use generative AI as a tool to help this process be more efficient and ideally be more accurate. But you don't want to completely abdicate control to the algorithm because then we know there is opportunity for error. So yes, we want to have humans in the loop, but the question is how. And one of the answers to the how is by giving the human more agency, by creating opportunities for friction, and to say, have a second look. Bring your insight to bear, human. Don't automate the human out of this process, but rather have the critical thinking of the human be baked in to the system. You write about um, a, a concept that you call anchoring. Can you describe for us what does anchoring mean and how does generative AI sort of feed into that with, with humans? So anchoring is a phenomenon, a co cognitive phenomenon that has been established in behavioral science where when people are making estimates or making judgments, numbers in their environments can be suggestions that cause them to uh, insufficiently move away from those numbers. So a classic example is an experiment where people were asked, how long did Mahatma Gandhi live? How old was Mahatma Gandhi when he died? Now, people who didn't know the answer to this question and didn't have benefit of Wikipedia were asked first two different types of questions in two experimental conditions. One was, did Mahatma Gandhi live beyond the age of 140? Now, this is obviously an easy answer. We know nobody lives uh, beyond that age. So the answer is no. In the other condition, they were asked, did Mahatma Gandhi live beyond the age of nine? Also a very easy question. Obviously, yes. Now, the number nine and the number 140 served as anchors in those respective experimental conditions. And so when people were giving their estimates as to the correct answer, the people in the condition with 140 had an estimate that was 17 years higher than the people in the condition with the nine. And that's because they anchored on a number that they knew was not correct, but insufficiently adjusted down. And so what we found in our experiment is that when you provide people with generative AI content, they anchor on this as well and insufficiently adjust away from it, such that 60 to 80 percent of what they ultimately create themselves with that input is the same as the generative AI. Interesting. Right? So you have a human in the loop, but they're anchoring on generative AI. So for us, this really means that we need to be thoughtful about the prompts, right? That the point of intervention needs to be before people receive that generative AI in many, in many ways. That, that that prompt is going to create content that becomes the anchor to develop within uh, managers. So tell us about the interventions that your team put into this study. What did you do to kind of create that friction and slow things down? So the control condition, you use a generative AI tool like a chat GPT, you get the content and you are able to apply it as you see fit, right? So there's no kind of friction or speed bump that says, hey, this is how you should use this. Uh, and so in our experiments where we used real people doing real tasks for their jobs uh, at Accenture, that was the control condition. But we had two experimental conditions where we added different levels of friction. So in the full friction condition, we were able to create labels and highlights. And these labels and highlights served as a means of calling their attention to certain things. So we had three kinds. One was, hey, according to the data, this looks pretty good. Uh, so that's, that's a green light, right? And we had another where it said, you know, you might want to have a second look at this. This may not be correct according to the available data. And then the third was, based on the prompt, 
just looks like there may be the following omission uh, that you should consider. So that was the full friction condition. All kinds of things, you know, if you're thinking of a traffic light, a green light, a yellow light, and a red light. In the medium friction condition, so the one between the control and the full friction, we had only the red light, right? Only the ones that said, you know, this doesn't look right to us, so you should, you should have a second look. And what we found, uh, according to the dependent variables that we measured, is that when you have no friction, uh, people are able to complete the task in the least amount of time. So it's really efficient. However, they also have more errors. So we planted errors to see how many people would be able to find. And they had the highest number of errors that they did not correct. In the full friction condition, we had the highest number of errors corrected. However, it took a significantly longer amount of time. So we believe that this just really created more cognitive load, more things to consider, uh, and therefore it lengthened the task time versus the control. However, in the medium friction condition, it was just right. So you got the best of both worlds. You got higher accuracy in less time. And so what was really compelling to us about this is that you could call attention to the weaknesses of an AI tool. You could tell people, hey, this might not be right, have a second look, and they still could get value out of it. Mm. It doesn't need to be perfect, and you don't need to act like it is. They can still gain benefit, the efficiency, but you can use these callouts and these frictions to preserve the quality and the accuracy. That's great because there is a sort of swing back and forth between people who just are embracing it wholly and then the people who's like, no, don't trust it. Exactly. So, so that sounds like a really useful tool. Do tools like what you did in your study, do those tools exist today? Can somebody go out and purchase something that would do that for them? Or are you hoping that your research will encourage the development of this kind of tool? I'm hoping that as people see that this can present benefits and not undermine the investments that they've made, that there will be tools like this in development. And we know that with uh, AI tools, different firms can create kind of their own proprietary layers. So this is something that we could see actually happening, right? You could have an internal database about your client's information, right? Proprietary data or private data. And you could have a tool that uses those data as well as the generative AI tools and is able to kind of correct and to gain the benefit while minimizing uh, the drawbacks by leaning into beneficial forms of friction. So thinking about where things are heading in the humans and algorithms working together, what do you think managers really should be paying most attention to in the months ahead? I think in the months ahead, we are seeing more and more tools presented and more shiny objects. And I think that managers need to be careful about the origin, right, of, of, of these outputs. So where is the source? Uh, how accurate is it? Is it proprietary? I think there needs to be an establishment of values before you start kind of willy-nilly using these tools, what are we using them for? Do we need to use them? Just because it's there, should we? I also think they need to be thinking about uh, return on investment. Does it actually provide value to your clients or your customers? Does it actually make the work better for your employees? And finally, I think that we need to think about the role of the humans who are actually using these tools as well as, as the customers, right? Are we improving the experience of our employees and are we improving the experiences of our customers? Employee experience and customer experience are two sides of the same coin and they're very, very much related. So preserving both of these, I think, is, is truly important. But it is an exciting time, and I understand uh, the, the excitement. 
I think we can pursue new horizons while at the same time being responsible and thoughtful as we do so. Great. Well, Renee, thank you so much for being with us today. Your research is fascinating and it's a really exciting world that we're all heading into, but having research that can helps organizations do that responsibly is uh, super important. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look for more on this topic from Renee in an MIT SMR article coming later this spring. Thank you for watching.